I guess before we get started, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming to this. Uh, this is going to be um, a presentation on a prototype to production of a base design for an IoT sensory tube. As you can see the IoT sensory tube is being functioned. He's controlling it from his phone through the internet and is able to uh, control the speed of the bubbles and color changes. All right, it's 9.45. Let's get this thing rolling. So <clears throat> let's start off with talking about what is sensory technology. Sensory technology is designed to mitigate the sensory challenges that are often associated with autism. These sensory challenges often present themselves in different ways for different individuals, which makes the versatility of the sensory technology very important. To accommodate the uh, uniqueness and the variety of individual symptoms, uh, these sensory rooms have been popping up all over the country. Um, this sensory tube is one of the many components that can be found in a sensory room. The sensory room is made up of different types of sensory components. Uh, the effects of a sensory tube are visually stimulating, which have been proven uh, very beneficial to the brain. So for some individuals, uh, the, the, sti the stimulation to the brain is very beneficial, while for others, uh, the presence of a sensory tube presents a calming effect to help uh, ease the sensory overload uh, symptoms that can be associated with autism. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is IoT, Internet of Things? Internet of Things can basically be defined as the interconnectivity of embedded computing devices in everyday products, such as a sensory tube, that can send and receive data over the Internet. By um, integrating the um, Internet of Things into a sensory tube, the product gains a sense of technological flexibility and control while still maintaining the um, interactive capabilities that are highly desired with these products. Um, in addition to that, uh, there, it doesn't have to be wired to the, to the product. It can be controlled from a smartphone or any, or any mobile device such as uh, the way Morgan is using it right now. As you can see, that's a, a picture of a sensory room. We've got several different components. They have some fiber optics and other interactive devices over there. So taking a step backwards, um, what's, what sparked the interest to build this prototype was when uh, Dr. Benton visited uh, the 2016 Autism Conference in Savannah, Georgia, where he learned uh, about the impacts of sensory overload. Um, there he also was exposed to a sensory room and was able to interact with some of the sensory technologies within the rooms. Um, after, after being in the rooms for a little bit, he, he felt the um, calming effects of the room and began to investigate uh, some of the costs of the sensory components, one of which was the sensory tube. What he found was that the prices were, of these components were ranging from $1,000 to more than $3,000. And for that price, he realized that he could make his own. So after looking at the sensory tube for a while, he realized the basic functionality of the tube is an air pump and a series of lights that's attached to a volume of water. The, light, the, uh, the lights that on the bottom project light up, upwards as the air pump pumps air into the water, allowing bubbles to rise to the top, reflecting, water, uh, reflecting light on the bubbles along the way. Um, he began buying the components for the, for the prototype after this realization. And meanwhile, he was configuring the electronics for the prototype so that he could later program an app to control this. Some experts would classify this prototype project into the maker movement paradigm, which is being seen all over the world. With um, DIY, 3D printing, rapid prototyping on the rise, um, makers are able to bring their ideas and designs to life through computer-aided drafting, which is CAD, um, and other available uh, computer-based resources. Additionally, suppliers are able to accommodate the demand for um, a variety of components, both electronic and not, so that a maker can create a product such as this without the traditional manufacturing expertise and resources that would be needed otherwise. So here we have some of the components that are found in this prototype. We have an air pump. This is the LED light ring with a microprocessor and Wi-Fi enabled chip. And this is a, what we call a breadboard, which is a, a tool that is used to help um, uh, 
make the circuitry of the electronics a bit easier. And then here you can see the uh, prototype and function, which you can also see to the right of the room. With increased recognition and diagnosis of the autism spectrum disorders comes an increase in demand and awareness for sensory technology. Uh, Dr. Bitten uh, aimed to address this issue by creating a prototype uh, that was uh, an, an affordable option to the currently highly priced uh, sensory technology available now. With, uh, with prices over $4,000, they're ranging um, high and low, but the, the point is they're very expensive and individuals are simply priced out of the opportunity of obtaining this if they need it. Um, though he did address the, address the problem, the, um, the, ba the prototype had some structural limitations um, which demanded for a base that would be structurally uh, supportive for the base to hold it upright, um, as well as uh, an ease of uh, assembly for an end user. Uh, should a, a base design come to play, he needed, he needed uh, production options to be able to produce this for more than just one tube, uh, should the demand increase. So, in, in effort to organize my thoughts throughout this project, I used a Six Sigma methodology called DEMAD-V, which is an acronym for Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, and Verify. The Define uh, stage is, where, is what we touched on on the last slide, is where we decide what's important. The market demanded for, or it didn't demand, but the market needed um, an alternative, affordable solution for sensory technology. Though Morgan addressed this situation, um, his prototype needed a base that was low in cost, easy to use, and could be uh, produced um, in a scalable way to whatever his desire was. Moving on to the measure stage, it was important to incorporate the voice of our customers. My customers for this project were the producer as well as in, uh, a potential end user. Um, in this case, um, I used a, an occupational therapist by the name of Faith Kuhner who works at the Catawba Mental Institute. Um, she uh, currently operates a sensory room and was familiar with some of the qualities and factors that go into the decision-making process of buying sensory components. After creating a list of quality attributes that would be desirable for a base design, I moved to the analyze stage. We needed to identify and evaluate three base options that would, be, uh, that would accommodate uh, the needs of both, both the producer and the end, end customer. We put the, put the three base designs to a test using a, a decision-making tool called a Pew Matrix. And after deciding which base was the best, we moved to the design stage where we built the, built the, the base that you see here. And um, we, needed, we came up with a need to find the production options moving forward. That's where the verify stage comes in. We came up with a, a basic, uh, basic production options as well as observations from the building process that can help make this process easier in the future. So on the left you see a list of quality attributes that are a combination from our producer and from our, our, our potential end customer. In the combination with this, we have a tool that we like to call Minimum Viable Product or MVP. MVP is used with new products and it is, it's used by creating a baseline product with only sufficient features. Only after considering feedback from our customers can we add new features. What this does is it helps uh, create the base design that is simple early on so that you don't overcomplicate um, over things uh, before you need to. From the combination of these two things, we were able to come up with three base designs. This first base design was uh, created in Fusion um, an Autodesk product, Fusion 360, which is a free uh, CAD software available to anyone. Uh, Dr. Benton made this, this one, and um, he was planning to 3D print this using PLA plastic in the JMU X Labs. Um, one of the, the, the biggest uh, features that was desirable for this design was that it was, would be printed out as one solid piece, which would be very easy for an end user to assemble, considering there is very limited assembly with one piece. Um, however, um, the time to, to print this out at the JMU X Labs, which is an 11, has an 11 inch uh, parameter on the dimensions, would be 168 hours of continuous printing without error. That's seven days. Um, that's a lot of time, and for an 11 inch base, we're not sure that, you know, that would, 
uh, conform to the, the structural support uh, parameters that we wanted to abide by for this project. So we looked into outsourcing the print job by um, uh, getting an estimate from an online uh, printing company, 3D printing company, uh, called Shapeways. They, we sent them the CAD file and they gave an estimate of around $1,000, which was a bit out of budget for what we were looking to pay for a base. So with the help of sophomore Andrew Lowe, who's sitting in the back in a nice purple shirt, uh, we, we uh, came up with two additional designs um, to, to help uh, decide which direction we wanted to go. The first one, we used that tool called MVP that I mentioned earlier by coming up with just a very simple triangular prism design. Um, it would be stable and the cost would be about $50, which is a lot less than 1,000, and the time to produce it would be three hours, which is a lot less than 168. However, as we, as we, um, we pro progressed through this design option, we realized that there would be uh, no serviceability or access to the electronic components on the inside, which was uh, kind of a setback for this design. And uh, there was, uh, due to the design, if we were to put wheels on it, it would, it would, be, uh, it would be awkward to roll around, and uh, without the wheels, it would be very difficult to move. So we came up with the third option, which was a cabinet-based design. Obviously, this is uh, the one that we settled on, but um, the cost of this was about $125 and it took about eight hours to produce. So a little bit more than the, uh, the very simple triangular prism design, but still a lot less than our 3D printable option. Um, some of the major factors that are desirable with this design is that it has a low center of gravity and wheels so that it's easy to move, but the wheels lock, have a locking feature so that it can be uh, set in, in place in the, if an individual wants to touch it and be interactive with the tube. Um, additionally, it has a square design and flat edges, which make it uh, very uh, easy to build. There's no weird angles to work with when building this, which is, um, for an amateur builder like myself, is very desirable. Um, you can reduce error that way. <laughs> um, so, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, we have the CAD file that Andrew created and it helped me with my dimensioning in creating this, uh, this design. So here we have a decision-making tool called a pew matrix. There's two of these made, one of them for my producer and one of them for my customer. Um, each, of, each of these the two individuals have uh, different opinions on which of these are the most important. So what I've done here is I've listed my attributes and on the far right I have um, a performance matrix. This is the same for both, um, both the customer and the producer. Uh, the numbers range from negative two to two, with two being very good and negative two being poor. Uh, and they relate to each of the options and tell you how well they perform uh, with respect to each of the quality attributes. And what we have in the center here is a weight. And, and what this essentially is, is a priority scale. How important is it on a scale of one to three? Um, how, how important are each of these? And what we'll see um, on the next slide is that the, the voice of the customer's priorities may change from the producer to the customer. Um, for the producer, the cabinet design came in first place, followed by the 3D printed uh, cone and with the uh, triangular design trailing behind. Similarly, we, we see the pew matrix with the cabinet design coming in first, uh, followed by the cone and then the triangle. On the, uh, on the far right, you can see how they're, they're similar in some ways, but they're different in others. This is very important to consider when, when creating a, a new design because you're gonna have different, different opinions to work with and you need to come up with a solution that accommodates the most of those needs for both of your, both of your customers. So as you may have guessed, through the uh, variety of clues in this presentation, we went with the cabinet design. Um, the cost of $125 was fairly reasonable and within budget of what we were wanting to spend with this project, as well as the, uh, the time to produce was in the range of what we can work with. And we believe that we can lower this time to produce uh, by leaning out the process a bit, which we'll talk on, talk, touch on a bit later. Um, overall, this design was a bit bigger and lower to the ground, or with a lower center of gravity than the other two options. And the ability to have locking wheels gave it enhanced mobility, which was one of the biggest factors that was requested by the end of user customer in the sensory room. Most importantly, 
this design encompasses the needs for both the producer and the consumer, and that is why we ultimately chose this goal, or chose this base. So in creating the base, I, I applied principles of design for manufacturing and assembly, which is DFMA, by uh, using the, the plywood in the most efficient way that I could. And uh, I used a square edges and a square base design and only used two different types of building materials, which was two by fours and, and plywood to keep the design simple and easy to reproduce. I used basic tools to uh, cut the wood and put it together, table saw, circular saw, um, hand drills, and um, I used nuts and bolts to assemble this uh, metal bracket design that is underneath uh, some of this paneling that's holding the tube upright. It's just shelf brackets. And I used uh, drywall screws to hold the wood together. So moving forward, I wanted to start off with some observations that I had made through the building process. Um, a phrase that some of you may be more familiar with than others. If you measure twice and cut once, I believe that you can save uh, some money, uh, maybe reduce the amount of scraps that you have at the end, and also reduce your build time. If I had done this, I might have uh, been able to make this product a lot cheaper, saved a lot of, a lot of time, and not have, have so much wood left over. <laughs> if anyone needs any wood. Um, <laughs> Also, the option to buy in bulk is an option if you have the storage space for it, which might not be feasible for our producer at this time. As you can say, see at uh, Home Depot, you had to buy 43 or more to uh, get that price break, which is only about $6. So that would be about 20 units just to get that price drop. Might not be feasible this time, but should the demand arise, we'll be ready for it. Um, and overall, uh, the more we reproduce this base design, the quicker your build time is going to be by uh, just becoming more comfortable with this, believe you can, you can cut down on cost and time and make this easier to make. So sending uh, the producer off with this design, I came up with four production options that I believe will help make this easier in the future. Um, by pre-cutting out the patterns and the pieces of wood to the lengths that you want ahead of time, it'll, uh, it would make it easier to send as a kit to your customer. Um, you could also pre-drill those holes, which I would recommend so that you don't split the wood. But this is a, an idea that IKEA encompasses and I think uh, would be a good option for, for uh, this base. Um, you could also outsource the cut and dr pre-drill process so that you don't have to do it. Get someone else to cut and, do it, cut and drill and then it can be either assembled by the producer or it can be assembled by the, the, the um, c customer depending on what the desires are and the shipping cost. The third option is the most simple one um, you could just do it all yourself and not have to pay other people to do it and and get good at it yourself. Mm -hmm. And the final one is you can do it all outsourced, which uh, may be an option should the uh, the demand come high enough that you just are done with it. So um, with these uh, with these recommendations, I believe that this uh, base will accommodate the alternative affordable solution for prototype or for sensory tube technology. And um, I think that it will be able to be reproduced much easier in the future with these recommendations. Um, before I conclude, I wanted to thank a few very special people for helping make this project a success. Um, Dr. Our Professor Simmons, thank you so much for helping me out through all of this. Um, Dr. Benton and Dr. Raswell, thank you for letting me use this tube and for making this tube and um, for helping solve this, uh, the problem of affordable sensory technology. And then also uh, the JMU X Labs and Hidden Acres Farm for letting me use their power tools and uh, their building space. And also uh, Rebecca Simmons' family for helping me out last night as I was finishing up my design. I'd also like to thank Sarah Puckett for letting me use her car all week long. Um, as it turns out, Volkswagen Jettas are not contractor approved. So um, you need a big car for this. Um, are there any questions? Uh, what stimulated my interest in this was to, um, I knew I wanted to do a manufacturing-esque uh, kind of project uh, that dealt with production systems. And um, I've always had an interest in special needs okay. and, um, and speci specifically autism. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a family member who is um, a, a certified behavioral an an analyst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been very close with the issue. So when uh, 
Dr. Benton presented this idea to me, I was able to kind of latch on and we've, this project has changed its form more times than I can count, but we finally settled on um, creating a base design for this so that he can potentially bring this to market and uh, offer, offer an affordable solution. What was the hardest challenge you faced during this project? Uh, the hardest challenge was, um, well, it wasn't building building the base. It, it was probably getting it around in a car, but um, getting the story in line, um, coming uh, coming up with how to um, how to talk about how I moved from not having a base to having a base and wanting to bring it to production. Um, I knew I wanted to con convey this information in an effective way, but it was difficult uh, coming up with how I wanted to organize that information. But uh, after using the uh, Six Sigma methodology to MADV, I was able to organize my thoughts a bit easier and um, convey the information to you. <coughs> How long did it take to make it? Uh, it took about eight hours of cumulative uh, work to <coughs> build that up, which uh, about two hours at a time. Um, I think I could. I think if I were to do it again. I would I would change a couple of things about it to make it a bit quicker, um, mainly measuring a little more efficiently. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I used the dimensions that uh, Andrew Lowe had provided me, and um, and then I I would acted like a human and decided I thought I could do it uh, a little more efficiently, and I cut a corner and here and there, and ended up using a little bit more time and resources than I m may have needed. So. Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> Someone over here? Did I see? Oh. Where would this be sold at? Um, so currently these uh, sensory tubes are sold online. Uh, one of the uh, websites is called Flag House and they sell a lot of sensory components. They're, you know, that was one of the pictures on the earlier slides, so over $4,000, very overpriced. Um, this could be sold on DIY forums, uh, tra uh, uh, sensory technology trade shows, or um, it, it all depends on where the producer wants to advertise. If there isn't a need for advertisement or a desire to do it, it could be a word of mouth thing. So that's still in the making as far as how we're going to sell it. <coughs> how long would you estimate it would take you to build the next one now that you've done it once and sort of figured out where you had trouble? I think you could cut the, uh, with, with just one person doing it, I think you could uh, move it from eight hours to easily five hours. Uh, maybe even a little bit better if you're a bit more of a skilled craftsman. Um, and by having someone else cut the pieces of wood and pre-drill the holes, you could probably drop the assembly time down to about one hour, maybe an hour and a half, which is pretty substantial increases. Right. Well, thank you all for coming, and I really appreciate your attention and time.